I want to speak to you about the very first foundation of what we believe in as a church. We believe, number one, that the Word of God is inspired of God. What do I mean when I say that? Although the scriptures were written by different people at different times over a certain period of time, God inspired the writing of the scriptures from the book of Genesis right through to the book of Revelation. Now listen to what 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 to 17 says. All scripture is God breathed and it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Notice that the Apostle Paul says all scripture. He did not renounce the Old Testament. Now we do believe in the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And that we are now under the New Covenant. But that does not mean that we forsake the Old Testament. The principles and revelation that comes forth from the Old Testament. In fact, it has been said that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed. And the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. None of the New Testament apostles had the New Testament to preach from. They preached from the Old Testament scriptures. And from that they brought forth revelation that we have today in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul included as well as Jesus Christ himself. Taught from the pages of the Old Testament. Now, I believe. That the Bible has been divinely inspired of God. And this makes it different from any other book in the world. Listen to what the Bible says in the Weymouth translation of 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 20 to 21. Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man but men spoke of God as they were carried along or impelled by the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit worked in the heart of every writer of the scriptures. The Bible, the word Bible, if you translate it in the Greek, it means the book. The Bible is the most circulated sold book in the history of man. And it's been translated into more languages than any other book. In fact, there have been whole libraries and books, commentaries that have been written to explain and complement the Bible. Now, I just want to give you just a couple of pointers surrounding this foundation that we believe in that God's word is inspired of God. Number one, Jesus approved the Old Testament. Matthew chapter 5 verse 18 says, Jesus speaking, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Jesus Christ himself said that. Number two, the Bible is the product of a supernatural sovereign God. It is his thoughts and his desires, plans and purposes put in print. Think about this. Over 66 books written by more than 40 authors, all living in different places from different backgrounds and different environments. And the Bible was written over a 1,600 year period. Some of the authors never even knew each other. yet. They wrote with the same theme and each adding, not contradicting to one another's revelation. This is nothing short of a miracle. And it can only be explained that it was God inspired. Eric Lund said this, listen to this. Among the writers, the holy men of God, for example, who spoke always inspired of the Holy Spirit, we find persons of various classes in education, since some are priests as Ezra, poets as Solomon, prophets as Isaiah, warriors as David, shepherds as Amos, 
statesmen as Daniel, sages as Moses and Paul, and unlettered fishermen as Peter and John. Of these, some formulated laws as Moses, others wrote history as Joshua, one wrote Psalms as David, another Proverbs as Solomon, some prophecies as Jeremiah, others biographies as the evangelists, others letters as the apostles. In respect to place, the writings were at points so distant as the center of Asia, to the sands of Arabia, to the deserts of Judea, to the porticos of the temple, the schools of the prophets in Bethel and in Jericho, the palaces of Babylon, and on the banks of the Shabur, and in the midst of Western civilization. Powerful. In other words, different people from different backgrounds with different occupation, occupations all had the same thought, line of thought, and this is a miracle in itself. Number three, all scriptures point towards Jesus from the book of Revelation, right, sorry, from the book of Genesis, right up to Revelation. Now listen to what Jesus himself said. Luke chapter 24, verse 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, Jesus, explained to them what he, what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. John chapter 5, verse 39 and verse 46. Listen to what Jesus says. You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. If you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. So all scriptures point to Jesus. In fact, I want to read what Rodney Howard Brown, the great revivalist, wrote in his book, Seeing Jesus as He Really Is. In Genesis, Jesus is the seed of the woman. In Exodus, Jesus is the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, Jesus is our high priest. In Numbers, He's our pillar of cloud by day and our pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, He's the prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, he's the captain of our salvation. In Judges, he is our lawgiver. In Ruth, he's our kingsman redeemer. In 1st and 2nd Samuel, he's our trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, he is our reigning king. In Ezra, he's our faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he's the rebuilder of the broken walls. In Esther, he is our advocate. In Job, he is our ever-living redeemer. In Psalms, he is the Lord, our shepherd, so we shall not want. In Proverbs, he is our wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, he is our gold. In the Song of Solomon, he is our lover, our bridegroom. In Isaiah, he is the Prince of Peace. In Jeremiah and Lamentations, he is the weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he is the wonderful four-faced man. In Daniel, he is the fourth man in the burning, fiery furnace. In Hosea, he's the eternal husband, forever married to the backslider. In Joel, he's the baptizer in the Holy Ghost. In Amos, he's our burden bearer. In Obadiah, he's our savior. In Jonah, he's the great foreign missionary. In Micaiah, he is the messenger with beautiful feet. In Nahum, Nahum he's our avenger. In Habakkuk, he's the evangelist pleading for revival. In Zephaniah, he's the Lord mighty to save. In Haggai, he is the restorer of lost heritage. Lost heritage. In Zechariah, he is the fountain springing up with everlasting life. In Malachi, he is the son of righteousness rising with healing in his wings. In Matthew, he is the Messiah. In Mark, he is the wonderful worker. In Luke, he is the son of God. In John, he is the son of man. In Acts, he is the Holy Ghost moving among men. In Romans, he is the justifier. In 1st and 2nd Corinthians, he's the sanctifier. In Galatians, he's the redeemer from the curse of the law. In Ephesians, he's the Christ of unsearchable riches. In Philipp uh, Philippians, he's the God who supplies all of our needs. In Colossians, he's the fullness of the Godhead body. In 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, he's our soon coming king. In 1st and 2nd Timothy, he's the mediator between God and man. In Titus, he's our faithful pastor. In Philemon, He's the friend of the oppressed. In Hebrews, he's the blood of the everlasting covenant. In James, he's the Lord who raises the sick. 
In first and second Peter, he's the chief shepherd who shall soon appear. In first, second, and third John, he is love. In Jude, he's the Lord coming with ten thousand of his saints. In Revelation, he's the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I just want to quickly correct something. In Luke, he's the Son of Man, and in John, he's the Son of God. Powerful. Jesus is found right throughout the pages of Scripture in every book. In fact, you can find types and shadows of Jesus right throughout the Bible. And that's a teaching for a whole nother day. From the Garden of Eden right up into the book of Revelation. Number four, the Bible is a prophetic book. We've got to understand this. The Bible is a prophetic book. What do I mean when I say it's a prophetic book? The Bible has prophecies. And those prophecies will come to fulfillment. Many great men and women have put prophecies in the scripture divinely inspired of the Holy Spirit. And these prophecies don't contradict one another, but they will come to pass. That's why the Bible says, God speaking in Isaiah 55 verse 11. That my word will not return void. In fact. Listen to what Jesus said, and I will read it once again. Matthew chapter 5, verse 18. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. In other words, every prophetic word spoken from the Bible will come to pass. Number five. The moral standards of the Bible prove its holiness. How do we know that the Bible is the holy Bible? It's because it's got a holy code. It has got teachings that have the highest moral standards known to man. In fact, I want to read you the scripture. Listen to what the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, God speaking, Be holy because I am holy. God also says through His word in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, Without holiness, no man can see God. Now, we don't believe that holiness is attained by performance. It is attained through the finished work of the cross and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. In our church, we also believe in standing when the word of God is read. Why? Because we give utmost respect to God's word. We find this from the scripture of Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 5, where the people of Israel stood at attention when Ezra the priest read the word of God. The word of God is holy. And the word of God is our ultimate authority. And this is our first foundation in what we believe in as a church. I want to also leave you with a thought. Listen to what the Bible says as the scriptures are concluded in Revelation chapter 22, verse 18 to verse 19. Now this is the last chapter of the whole Bible. Listen to this. For I testify to everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. And if anyone takes away from the words of this book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, from the things that are written in this book. This book, we believe every word is holy and we are not to add to it and we are not to take away from it. That's why in our church, we strictly preach the word of God. We don't preach conspiracy theories. We don't preach the ideas of man. We preach what God's word says. If it's in God's word, we can stand upon it. If it's in God's word, we will teach it. If it's in God's word, we will believe it. If it's not in God's word, we want no part in it. In fact, Jesus said, if we listen to his teachings and we do what he said, we will be likened unto a wise man that built his house upon the rock. Matthew chapter 7, verse 23 to verse 27. 
You cannot have a strong foundation for the storms of life if you do not have the Word of God as your foundation. So, our very first foundation as a church, what we believe in, is that God's Word is divinely inspired. And we build our lives upon that, we teach it, we preach it, because that's what God has called us to do, and we honor His Word in all that we do, in our daily living, in how we function as a church. God bless.